Andrew, I'm excited to catch up with you here at DTW in Copenhagen. Um, you know, there's a lot to talk about at this show, but maybe we can set the stage a little bit. As it relates to network autonomy, TM Forum gives us a, a little bit of a baseline in their autonomous networks project and the maturity index that goes along with it. So that's basically six levels and most operators self-report at level one or two, so partial autonomy generally. Uh, is that consistent with what you're seeing amongst your customer base? And then how do we start moving up that maturity index? Yeah, it's a good question. So honestly, I think the perspective of how to measure it and the goals and the ambitions is consistent. Um, <laughs> Whether the achievements are consistent is a different question. I know there have been a lot of surveys recently where um, you know we've got a view in terms of where the market feels it is on these things. I have to say, I think quite a lot of our customers are a little optimistic in the way they score themselves. And we don't see the level of automation out there yet that I think the industry either has the ambition to achieve or even the individual operators would like to see. But having said that, there's definitely the interest and the intent to move in that direction. And so we have very active conversations with our customers around how we can build those automation capabilities into our solutions and above our solutions to help them on that journey. Yeah, so I mean, AI obviously the predominant theme here, but conversations around autonomous networking long predate the sort of hype around AI at the moment. Uh, your comment that maybe some of that self-reporting was a bit optimistic, it, do you think that we see an acceleration at least now that we have carrier grade generative AI solutions and something of a framework for how to apply them to network operations? Well, I think yes and no. A couple sorry, of things sorry. I would say is that firstly, you're in a position where this technology I think is accelerating the ambition once again because what it's doing is it's open up the opportunity to actually address more use cases because the more advanced AI is capable of fulfilling those in a way that maybe previous generations of automation weren't. So I think it has stimulated that interest level and that kind of aggression in terms of how they're deployed. One thing I would say though is that when you look at the automation use cases that we see across the customers, this isn't kind of like a place where all of a sudden we have a new technology that is the one and only answer. There's still very much a place for kind of core algorithmic answers to things or machine learning. And it really depends on what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve. So I think the pace at which a lot of the use cases are moving forward in the industry, they're not changed for where those technologies are still the right answer. What we're seeing is an acceleration of how we can do more because of the additional capabilities of the latest generation of AI. Well, so as it relates to the use cases, help me kind of separate signal from noise here a little bit. I, I think, you know, as a generative AI call center, we've seen a lot of success there, that's very straightforward. And then maybe more classical machine learning, RAN energy efficiency, that seems to be a, a big focal point. But what do you see as ready to go today that can kind of tick those dual boxes of help me save money, help me make money? Yeah, I mean, I think in the case of generative AA, the one thing I wouldn't say is that it is confined to the CX layer and the external environment. If you think around the ability to support operational um, staff in a network environment, people who are running a network, they're trying to do performance improvements or fault remediations, having effectively agent assist for them is super important. So we have actually been working on some use cases where we, meet, we feed these large language models with all of our kind of history around faults and outages and the characteristics of those and all of our product documentation. And that allows support and operational staff to actually get assistance as those things happen in the network. So I think those operational use cases can still be accelerated and enhanced by generative AI. Now, we are leaning in a lot with things like Agentic, of course, to that more external facing. And I think you have a couple of things there. There's definitely traction that we're seeing in agent assist, right? And using things like the AI capabilities in cloud to support transcription or sentiment analysis or next best offer, right? That is definitely getting a lot of traction and it's thing that we're building into our products. The other thing is using those agents as external facing direct channel to the customer. Now, one of the interesting things I think that we face there is that we're right at the moment in the phase of actually training those models to do those customer interactions. 
but I'm not sure that we've actually remembered that the other thing we need to train them in is how to deliver a customer experience on those transactions as well. So I think this is just the start of the journey for Agentic AI in terms of its ability to be a true digital channel for customers. Yeah, let, let's talk more about Agentic AI. I just sat through a half hour presentation out here in the, the keynote area and um, I think there was a good deal of magical thinking going on <laughs> in there. It was almost being billed as something that will you know, solve all of your business problems today. Yeah. You just have to get started, you know, sign right here doesn't seem that way to me, right? Like, I, I feel like we're at that point in time where there are some things that lend themselves to a closed loop, but by and large, everything is still either open loop or human in the loop. But just as it relates to operators using Agentic AI, what is the right place to start? What is the right place to really fully take your hands off the wheel and just let the computer run? Yeah, I, I mean, look, I have to agree with your sentiment, right? I mean, I don't think we as Oracle Communications are one of those companies that is trying to necessarily over promote where we are with this technology today. I think there are two points of inertia that I would highlight that we have in terms of the adoption of Agentic. The first one is that you need to actually change your business processes to allow the injection of these closed loop you know, activities. And that is something that isn't easy to do. Um, and that a lot of our customers today are still trying to figure out where do I want to inject these closed loop automations and these agents into those business processes and where is it safe to do so as well, right? The second thing is I think there's a lot of hesitance on applying full closed loop zero touch, particularly into things that are directly service affecting or are an intrinsic part of your network operation, right? And particularly when you move into some of the newer iterations of AI like Gen AI, Honestly, using technologies that are inherently designed to hallucinate, I mean, it's one of their actual positive attributes in a way, um, isn't probably something a lot of customers want to do with those mission critical components. So, you know, I do recommend that the main focus should really be in that CX environment, more in the agent assist mode at the moment, while we understand how well this technology performs, it's a much softer way to then inject it into the business processes that need to be changed as well. And I think once you see success, then you can start to do that. One thing that's struck me in my conversations here with operators is just the, the pace of change. And you know, we use words like agile and flexible, and um, you know, that's maybe aspirational in a lot of cases, but when you have technologies that kind of fit under this umbrella of AI that are changing weekly, monthly, how does it, an operator effectively consume those? How do you keep up? <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, I think there's two ways that I see our customers looking to, to effectively adopt these technologies. The first one is they want us as vendors to do it for them, i.e. they want to see it embedded into the solutions that we actually build. Now, that I think is actually quite a smart way to do it because what you're effectively doing there is you're saying, listen, what I'm interested in is, is the outcome. I'm interested in whatever it is you're delivering using that technology and the change that it either delivers to my business or to my customer. And that makes it very outcomes driven, which is quite measurable and easy to understand. So I think there's a push there, and of course that means the speed actually becomes more incumbent on us as, as providers rather than the customers needing to worry about building. Now then you have the second area which is, well hey, why don't I think about building a standalone capability in this space and I can actually start to create my own use cases as a customer built on the various data sources and, and things that I have. Now that I think is a lot harder to actually do as a business because two things there stand in your way. Number one is the data and the integrity of the data becomes key, right? Being able to make sure that you can collect in a uniform way from all of the different data sources that you have and know that your data is clean is paramount to the outcomes that you get. The second thing is you have to actually then define your own use cases. And there's a lot of work there in terms of really understanding where's the best return on investment? What are the things that are gonna move the needle for my business? Because you're outside of your core product set now, so you're talking about overlay capabilities. So I think it's a lot more challenging for a lot of the customers to build standalone AI capabilities and to your point, to then face that notion of the technology keeps changing underneath me and if I've invested in these suites, 
how do I now kind of retrofit them to keep pace? So some thoughts there on that. So you've got a keynote session with the CTO of Vodafone, and I, I think this is a, a really interesting one where you get into this idea of innovation being an ongoing process. Like you don't you don't start and finish innovating, right? But right. can you maybe tell us a little bit more about not just the technology, but the actual change management that goes into that? Yeah, I mean, the session that I did with Scott, um, I have to say, I thought he raised three really important points. and. You know, you mentioned change management there at the core of what he shared with the audience was really around how to make Vodafone a more agile business, right? How they can move faster, how they can improve their velocity in product creation and deployment and time to market. And, you know, there were three main points, I think, that sat across the way they've tackled it. The first one is cloud foundation. And so they understood very early on that moving into the cloud and having cloud infrastructure underneath everything they did was, was the starting point for that. And you know they were actually one of the first big telco customers that took our, our DRCC, our, our dedicated region cloud customer product as Oracle. Um, and that became effectively a universal fabric that Vodafone used for front office, for back office, even for some of the enterprise applications they took to market. So that was kind of like stepping, you know, or building block number one that Vodafone took. The second one was around APIs and the way to effectively drive a disaggregated architecture. And the interesting thing I think from Vodafone is that again, they were leaning into this much more from the perspective of, this wasn't really driven by a desire for us to have vendor agnostic or the ability to easily swap and change vendors even within the same vendor environment by building these open interfaces inside of the architecture you actually end up with a lot more flexibility as you go into new products or new journeys or new business flows because if you don't have that kind of approach what you've typically found is that you integrate your system in a very hardwired way for what you had in mind at the time that you did the design so that kind of API first mentality was the second thing. And the third one is, is AI, I mean, the way that they're leaning into AI, right? And they've actually had a very long history now in terms of using, in, in the old language, bots to support their customer interactions. Um, but they're also now driving a lot of IA across their business, even from back office to front office, to effectively drive productivity and efficiency. And so this is really all the components from their perspective that they spoke to, which is about how do we go agile? How do we make Vodafone you know, a change-friendly organization? So I guess one last question here, Andrew, as I've walked around the show floor, I've seen a lot of what I would describe as point solutions. And I don't mean that as a criticism. You've got to start somewhere. But the real value comes in when we have AI at a, as a system solution, right? So just any advice that you would give to operators about how they can invest incrementally in AI while still being mindful that there's a, a bigger picture here that they need to pursue? Yeah, I mean, I, I think two things I would say. Number one, I mentioned earlier that a lot of our customers are leading into, hey, we would like you to put those capabilities inside of your products. That's the softest landing way, right, which is, Let's leverage the power of those capabilities through the products we already have so that those products can deliver the use cases we want. And that becomes almost zero touch, right? So I think that is kind of advice number one. The second one is if you want to go on that journey around how do I build an overlay capability that can open up the opportunities for me to do things that even my vendors can't do across my business, that transition into cloud is really important. And I say that because Honestly, the large language models are, are really all resident in cloud, which means if you're actually trying to do a cloud to ground for that solution because all your systems are still on the ground, that becomes a very difficult integration challenge, but it also is intrinsically a, a challenge from the perspective of uniformity of the data models, because you will undoubtedly have a very diverse set of data models. So I think you need to be thinking about that at the point when you're a long way towards your cloud transition journey, right? Now, fortunately, and this isn't unique to Oracle, but the one thing that that doesn't mean at the moment is that everything has to be off-prem, because there are a lot of on-prem cloud solutions that companies like Oracle can offer. So, you know, I do draw that distinction between make that cloud transition, you know, advanced, mature, that gives you the power to adopt these AI capabilities. But if for whatever reason, data sovereignty, security, 
public cloud is not the place to go, you still have an answer. Excellent, Andrew, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, chat with me and share your perspective with our audience. It's been a pleasure, thank you so much. Thank you.